Hello, friends. So I'll be giving a very brief overview on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. It's mainly on prognostication. So this was a question asked in DRNB, and this is a very important topic for all our IC trainees to have absolute clarity because these are the type of cases we see fairly often in ICU. Uh, so I won't be dwelling into all the causes. I'm sure more for so the commonest cause of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is post cardiac arrest. So we need to have absolute clarity as to what are the variables that we need to depend upon in prognosticating hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And I'll show you how these variables have evolved and the evidence behind it. So for all our trainees, the quintessential variable for prognosticating in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is clinical. So that is the gospel. So don't look at biochemical variables or uh, sensory uh, somat somatosensory evoked potential, the EGMRI, they're all adjuncts. But the money lies in good clinical assessment. So there are a lot of parameters, but I'll give you a summary at the end of it. So there are certain parameters that, has, that they have identified as indicators of poor prognosis. So one thing, as intuitively you would know, is duration of anoxia. So if the duration of anoxia bar hypoxia is more than 8 to 10 minutes, it is associated with unfavorable prognosis. And duration of CPR. So I'm sure you don't need rocket science to tell this. If duration of CPR is more than 30 minutes, obviously it has a very poor prognosis and bad outcome. And pupillary reaction to light. So the pupillary reflex to the light at day three, if it is absent, this also you don't need rocket science to tell you that it is a poor prognostic marker. So pay attention to the pupillary light reflex because all studies consistently show that at day three, the pupillary light reflex is not present. It is equivocally or it is very conclusively you can decipher that they are associated with bad prognosis. And this also pay attention, motor response to painful stimuli at day three. If it is absent, they are consistently shown to have poor outcome neurologically and even outcome and mortality. So pay attention to pupillary light reflex, pay attention to motor response to the pain. So you can give supraorbital pain, you can give sternal pain or any bony prominence. If that is absent or extends our response at day three. So the, another important sacrosanct number to keep in mind is prognostication can be conclusively made at the end of 72 hours. And this is what has shown been shown by multiple studies. <clears throat> so day three, absent motor response is very important. And of course, brainstem reflexes are absent. So you don't need much of insight to tell that it is associated with good prognosis. This is something new. Blood sugar level, if it is more than 300 milligram per deciliter, has shown to be having a poor prognosis at the time of admission. And day three GCS less than five. So you can remember this also. If day three GCS is less than or equal to four, although it is said five, most studies later on have shown less than four is conclude. You can conclusively say that they are. So in this table, if you can remember, you are pupillary light reflex at day three and motor response to pain and day three GCS less than four. I think these three are found to be important in subsequent lot of other studies, which I will show you. So these are some of the indicators they have shown. But then there is a somewhat detailing on this with regards to whether can be conclusively say at day three, or there are certain indicators that one would look at one week, and are there certain indicators that you would look at uh, two weeks. So there are a few other studies which has looked into uh, initial examination. So as you see in this table, just focus, the first column is where there is no chance of regaining independence. And what are the signs that shows there is chance of regaining independence? So at the initial, means after post-cardiac arrest, if pupillary reflex is lost, it's a bad sign. But on the contrary, if pupillary reflex is present, so that gives you some hope that there is a chance of regaining independence. Or if patient has decorticate, which is abnormal flexor response at presentation, that also may tell you that there is some hope of them making some recovery. Or if they have decelerate, if they have extension, this is at presentation, they may be indicators that there is some hope over the course of time that they may improve. Or if they have oculocephalic reflex or roving conjugate eye movements, 
So any eye movements that are present at presentation, these are all initial indicators that may compel you to wait for up to 72 hours to see because there may be hope of recovery. That is at initial examination. On day one, if at day one, at the end of day one, if they are having decorticator, like abnormal flexion, and there are, this is important, there is no eye movements whatsoever. There is no lateral eye movement or upward eye movement or there is no downward eye movement or rotational movements in the with the movement of the head. So that is also, so there has to be some eye movements is a good sign. So there is absolutely no movement of the eye in any direction uh, indicates that possibly you're looking at a poor prognosis and there's no chance of regaining good independence. But on the contrary, if they have a normal flexor response and if there is improvement in the eye opening by two grades, then these are indicators that there is hope. So these are just a comparator as to what are the signs. So eye movements, which uh, traditionally you would only look at pupillary eye reflex. So whenever you open the eyes, do look into whether there is some movement of the eyes. So some movement of the eye, either upward, downward gaze, or rotational movement, they may portend that uh, you know there is some hope. But if there's absolutely no movement, so that is a bad thing. So day three, if there is still decorticate or abnormal flexor response, and there is no eye movement. So it means that there is no chance of gaining good independence or no recovery. But on the contrary, if day three, they have a flexor response or they're localizing to pain. So and obviously you don't need rocket science or a great sort of a knowledge to know that patient is improving at day three. So pretty much as you see in this also by day three, you know the progression has happened from abnormal flexion, abnormal extension to eye movements, and to the localizing, by day three, then you know that significant improvement has happened and the prognosis is good. And by day three, if you are seeing all range of good eye movements, then you know that the functional recovery is likely to happen and it is good. So at the end of one week, if uh, so this is we are extending beyond three days, you want to ascertain whether there is going to be good prognosis. At the end of one week, if there is non-purposive motor movement, it is not purposive in nature, or there is no orientation with the eye or no purposive eye contact, then that also means they may not uh, they may not recover to a functional independent state. And obviously by one week, the other group may be obeying commands, then you know they are doing well. So non-purposive motor movements and no non-purposive eye movements without eye contact at the end of one week will possibly tell you that they may not regain full functional independence. And of course, at the end of two weeks, if this non-purposive motor response is still present and the eye opening or eye movements has not improved in the grades and uh, if it is remained the same, then it is poor. So this is a more detailed sort of a follow through after three days, up to one week and two weeks, which tells you whether they'll regain full independence or they would not regain full independence. So this is also something you can keep in mind after day three. But until day three, we don't need so much of detailing. So I, we can only look at pupillary lift, light reflex. We can look at motor response to pain. We can look at GCS less than four. Uh, I think those three things should be good enough. And corneal reflex also has been given emphasis in subsequent studies, which I'll show you. So this is important. So why GCS less than four? I think the first table I showed you, GCS less than five. These, these are the two studies. One come from Belgium and one come from Austria. GCS less than or equal to four at 48 hours has conclusively shown to be associated with poor outcome, which means death or persistent vegetative state. So less than four is something you can keep in mind at the end of 72 hours. And this is also another thing, so at the 24 hours, if there is absent pupillary light reflex and there's an absent corneal reflex, then there is an absent motor response. And at the end of 72 hours, there's absent motor response. These two studies from US and Canada have shown they are associated with poor outcome and they would not improve. So uh, th this is a meta-analysis from Netherlands. I think this is what I want all our listeners to bear in mind as a conclusive clinical science that one should look at. There are two criteria which are 100% specific for poor outcome and which I have repeated time and again. They are absent pupillary light reflex at day three, and there is abnormal flexion or abnormal extension, which is decerebrate or no motor response and absent corneal reflex. 
So these three things, if they are present at day three or at the end of 72 hours, which I've been repeating, absent pupillary reflex, absent corneal reflex, absent motor response at the end of three days, and GCS less than or equal to four, with 100% certainty, you could testify that patient will very unlikely to recover in a meaningful way with regards to neurological status. So that is the take home from regards to clinical assessment. But one has to be cognizant that one has ruled out confounding factors, whether there is any sedation on board. And because very often these patients may be on some sedation, may be on some analgesia. So make sure that none of these are there as confounders, which may act as a limiting factor in making clinical sort of a conclusions and make sure there is no metabolic derangements like uremia or uh, you may have hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, so on and so forth. And many of these post-cardiac arrest, you may have induced hypothermia. So make sure there is no induced hypothermia because that can also act as a confounder in making good clinical assessment. So for all my ICU trainees, please remember with regards to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you have to only look at four things. So absent pupillary reflex, absent corneal reflex, absent motor response, and GCS less than or equal to four at the end of 72 hours. You have enough studies and this meta-analysis from Netherlands, which came in Lancet, pretty old, but they have shown it 100% specific for poor outcome, but make sure that all the confounding factors are removed. So then there are a lot of advanced sort of scoring tool. This is a coma recovery scale. So then there is a coma recovery scale revised. So there are multiple scales, but I don't want any of us because you wouldn't be dwelling into detailing. This is maybe later on after one week, two weeks, if you want to prognosticate. These have six hierarchical components like auditory function scale, visual function scale, motor function scale, verbal function scale, communication, arousal scale. So they, they score it totally, but this is not for our intensivists to memorize all this. But bear in mind, there are other scales, like coma recovery scale, revised is something which is validated. To do long-term prognostication for this HIEs, maybe after one week, two weeks, on and so forth. So I, do, I wouldn't expect any of us to remember all this. So what are the other clinical tools? So if there is myoclonic status epilepsy, I'm sure many of our intensive care friends would have seen post-cardiac arrest, they have myoclonic jerks. We call it as myoclonic jerks, it's myoclonic status. And studies have very clearly shown if patients post cardiac arrest, if they have myoclonic status epilepticus, it is conclusively shows that they are associated with poor outcome and even death in the hospital. And we have published uh, one of the video CMEs. So I think I'll just show you how the myoclonic uh, status looks. So this is the myoclonic status. Watch carefully. You can see the myoclonic jerks that are happening. So if this is there, then possibly they are going to die in the hospital and it is conclusively associated with the venice. You can see that myoclonic friends. So this we published as a video CMB in Journal of Acute Care and this was secondary to a uh, different reason. But this is the myoclonic status. This was in dengue encephalopathy. You can see that. So this is a typical myoclonic status. You can see the twitching movement. See that? See it, friends? So you can see the twitching movement. This is myoclonic status. If this is there, it is equivocally or conclusively or a confirmatory sign of poor outcome. Okay. I can see that myoclonic. Okay. So now, so you have, so as I said, the, the sacrosanct for establishing good prognosis or prognosis about bad outcome is clinical assessment. And remember these four things that should be good enough. Then, of course, if you have any metabolic parameters which is confounding or if you have any other toxins which may be confounding, so sometimes you have to adopt certain ancillary tests to substantiate uh, prognosticating. So somatosensory evoked potential has found to be very good. So this is, this is done by stimulating the median now and they look for the N20 sort of a pattern. And if this is absent, the N20 wave is absent in somatosensory evoked potential, it is shown to be associated with a poor prognosis in uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And this comes from this Italian study. The likelihood ratio of them not recovering is 12. And as you see, the confidence interval was significant. So the N20 pattern is absent in median nerve stimulation in somatosensory evoked potential. It is conclusively associated with a poor outcome. 
and the false positive is zero and that was also shown by this study from australia so there are good studies to say that absence of n20 pattern in median nerve stimulation with somatosensory evoke potential is associated with a poor outcome then how about eeg so eeg uh, in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is divided into three categories one is benign and one is non convulsive status and the third which is which portends ominous signs is malignant eeg so what what is malignant eeg when they have burst suppression you can see this is a burst suppression where you have the burst of activity and then there is a suppression if you have a burst suppression in eeg it is associated with a poor outcome or if you have generalized periodic complexes or if you have low voltages less than 10 microvolts or if you have alpha theta pattern so these are the patterns which are categorized under malignant eeg and they are associated with a very poor outcome and it is shown if they have malignant pattern in the eeg there is increased mortality the mortality is up to 91% versus 54% in the study that came from switzerland so this is the relevance of eeg as an adjunct to prognosticate hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy then all our trainees i think they would be very fancied with all this biochemical tests and exams we keep asking what is that biochemical marker for uh, eeg so there are few tests but all these are of academic value they have no clinical relevance so neuron specific enolase is one of them and glial s 114 and creatine kinase they have done a lot of studies but friends this can be asked in exam but it has no clinical relevance so don't fixate lot of attention to memorizing all this and people have done csf lactate they have done csf adenylate kinase they have done csf ldh csf acid phosphatase and csf glutathione so these are some of the biochemical markers that have done and this study there was a meta analysis to look at the relevance of all these biochemical tests and the meta analysis has shown that there is in this is these tests are insufficient on its own to predict clinical outcome they can only used as an adjunct to the clinical so the the gospel or the sacrosanct test is your clinical acumen and your clinical tool they are the best and if you want to add something to it you can add somatosensory evoked potential or eeg and maybe mri but none of these biochemical tests are good enough to predict outcome and they can be used only as an adjunct so then the last one not and the last but not the least and important is imaging so mri so mri with adc mapping which is apparent diffusion coefficient mapping i'm sure most of the i should trainees would be dealing with this so diffusion coefficient mapping with mri but most important for all trainees mri at day 5 it has to be done not immediately at done at day 5 is shown to be a very good prognostic marker and that came from this study from switzerland so friends that's that's all it is about uh, the whole prognostication so bear in mind and pay attention to the clinical tools the absent pupillary light reflex absent motor re response at day 3 absent corneal reflex and gcs less than or equal to 4 at day 3 is good enough to conclusively say that patients are unlikely to recover provided you have ruled out all the confounders like metabolic sedation or induced hypothermia the adjunct test that you can rely on in somatosensory evoke potential absence of n20 and malignant eeg pattern and mri at day 5 and biochemical test you can bear in mind for the academic value so that's all it is there and if you know this much i think you are pretty good in prognosticating any of the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy So I request all of you to attend our signature conference, JIC, that's happening from 18 to 20th October uh, in Bengaluru. So I request all our esteemed audience to please attend and make it a huge success. So I request all of you to submit your valuable work to our Journal of Acute Care, which comes out every three months. And visit my website. So thank you, thank you, one and all.